News starts right now. The San Antonio City Council passing a record $3.1 billion budget earlier today. It restores many of the cuts the city made during the pandemic while also investing in affordable housing, public health, and new approaches to policing. Our Garrett Berger takes us through some of the highlights of what was passed and also what was rejected. Motion carries. We have a budget. Not just any budget, the city's largest ever. It's a big budget, but this is a big city. With revenues looking better than last year and federal dollars available to help prop things up, the new budget includes more money for public health, pre-pandemic levels of street maintenance funding, 15 new police officer positions, mostly for safe officers, and new ways for the city to respond to calls for service including a pilot program for some mental health calls. I think the real work begins now. If the council approved the budget. We've got a lot of things we got to put into production and it starts tomorrow. There were a handful of changes to the original proposal agreed upon last night, but council members also spent several hours considering other last minute proposals. District 10 councilman Clayton Perry tried to pave the way for a property tax cut by cutting how much the city contributes to VIA by 5.7 million. And after the rest of the council voted that down, District 2 Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez tried the same tactic with SAPD's half billion dollar budget, also unsuccessfully. We are not talking about defunding. We are not talking about decreasing from previous years. We are talking about increasing by a slightly less amount than we were going to increase by. And after his own failed attempts at last minute changes from the dais, for District 1's Mario Bravo abstained from voting on the budget in a protest against the process. It's, this budget's 452 pages, and not one of my proposals is in it. Despite Bravo's abstention and Perry's no votes on portions dealing with property taxes, the budget passed and goes into effect October 1st. Now, this won't be the only spending that the city considers this year. There's also the lion's share of federal dollars that they got through the American Rescue Plan Act that still need to be allocated. Plus, there's an upcoming five-year bond project that's expected to be voted on next spring. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. We have new information to tell you about that shooting where a man was shot by New Braunfels police during an attempted arrest. We first told you about the story yesterday. It's police identifying that suspect as 28-year-old Aaron Arnaldo Gomez. Gomez was in critical condition after being shot by an officer who was in the path of his vehicle. Police were attempting to serve Gomez a felony warrant. He's accused of an aggravated kidnapping where a 22-year-old woman was held against her will earlier yesterday. Two officers involved are on administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigation. And a heart-pounding wake-up call has given away to heartbreak for families at a northwest side apartment complex. They lost their homes to an overnight fire. It destroyed or damaged more than half a dozen units at the complex in the 6100 block of Vance Jackson. As Katrina Weber reports, some people say they had to make a daring escape. Thick smoke clouds an area that, until firefighters arrived, also had been heavy with flames. People at the Oak Creek apartment say a fireball erupted outside one unit just before 12.30 this morning, then quickly spread. Vanessa Posadas rushed to the 6100 block of Vance Jackson after getting a call from family members whose door was blocked by the fire. They all had to jump out through their balconies, and, I mean, the fire was so intense, uh, it just blew out the whole front. She says her 73 year old father climbed over his patio wall to escape. Very traumatizing, very traumatizing. Others got out with only the clothes they were wearing. My father's car is parked right here. The fire was so hot, the whole front of his vehicle is burnt in. Firefighters say no one was injured. They also managed to rescue some pets. All eight units, which includes the leasing office, either were destroyed or left with damage. Some of the people who were displaced have been helped at least temporarily by the American Red Cross, but it's unclear where they will go from here. There's no way my dad and my sister and my niece can live here any longer. Posada says she hopes her relatives will find another place to stay. Fire investigators, meanwhile, set out to find the cause of the fire. Neighbors say they heard a loud argument moments before it started. But investigators have yet to determine if there's a connection. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. 
Fire officials believe some squatters might have caused a fire that left a home with $30,000 worth of damage. The fire broke out just before 3 a.m. at a home off Jennings Avenue, not far from South Sarsamora in Frio City Road. When fire crews arrived, flames could be seen coming from the home. They were able to put out the flames quickly with no injuries reported, but the cause of the fire is still unknown. COVID testing at schools a top priority for San Antonio ISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez and the district says they will continue to test even after he leaves for Chicago later this month. The district says more than 79,000 COVID-19 tests have been administered so far this year. Among students, they have seen about 1,000 positive cases since school started. San Antonio ISD has been working with the nonprofit community labs to test students for COVID-19 since last year. The president of Community Labs says Superintendent Pedro Martinez is a strong supporter of testing at schools. Pedro Martinez has been a, a supporter uh, of us from the very beginning, and he took a leadership role in wanting testing in his schools to, to keep as many children in school as possible. It's a way to keep us safe as well as our students and their families safe. Rivera says there have been less than 10 COVID cases reported this year at the Advanced Learning Academy, and COVID testing has allowed students to continue with their everyday lives. And despite what many may think, the nation's suicide rate actually fell during the pandemic by 6%. That's according to an American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. However, there were still those who did die by suicide. Our Jesse de Goyado spoke to a man who hopes sharing his brother's story of suicide will help others. Even as children, Christian Bove had his brother's smile, his older brother Hector, who took his own life last year. Much like other suicides, it came as a total shock. You know, I, I spoke to him literally just two days before and sounded perfectly fine. Any death, he says, is difficult and heartbreaking, and yet... I think when it comes to suicide, it, it's just compounded because there's so many questions there's, you know, the whys, the, uh, you know, what could I have done differently? Bove says his brother had always been active and thrived on being around others. The pandemic changed everything. You know, I, I have no doubt that played a role in, in my brother's loss just because he lived alone. But the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention found the national suicide rate last year during the pandemic dropped 6%, its sharpest decline in four years. But even if they have or, or remaining steady, it's still way too many, you know, obviously one is too many, much less the thousands that we're seeing, um, you know, daily and weekly. He urges anyone who needs it, get help right away. And for their friends and loved ones. Don't hesitate to dig deep. You know, don't settle with, how are you doing? I'm um, okay. That right there doesn't mean they're okay. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. So what are some of those warning signs of suicide? Take a look. Some examples include talking about wanting to die or looking at ways to kill oneself, having feelings of hopelessness, no purpose, trapped or unbearable pain, increase in substance abuse, displaying extreme mood swings, just to name a few. And here's what to do if you recognize some of those warning signs. Do not leave the person alone, remove any weapons, alcohol, drugs or sharp objects and or take the person to an emergency room or seek help from a medical or mental Mental health professional. And as you saw at the bottom of the story, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. We have all this information right now on KSAT.com. Just click on the story. It out the very latest on the border wall, the Texas Facilities Commission awarding a contract to companies to oversee the construction of the border wall along the Texas-Mexico border. The vote to approve the contract worth $11 million made today. Michael Baker International and Hewitt Zolars are the companies involved. It's a joint venture between the design firm and engineering firm. Today they will manage the budgets, identify state land for wall construction, and find willing private landowners to facilitate the construction according to the request for proposal. Back in June, Governor Greg Abbott announcing a crowdfunding effort to pay for the wall and fencing. Abbott pledged $250 million of state money to start the effort. And some money up for grabs, seriously. More than $6 billion in unclaimed cash and other valuables are being held by the Texas state, by the state of Texas. The state's comptroller's office made the announcement today. If you think you might have an unclaimed case, you can search online at claimittexas.org or you can call 
800-321-2274. There is no time limit for owners to file a claim for unclaimed property the state holds. For fiscal year 2021, more than $285 million was given back to Texans. For the link to that website, head over to ksat.com. Have you checked your name yet? See I if there's actually, anything on there? Last year, I did, and I got it. You got some money? Yes. I had some uh, check from my insurance and then a check from like 10 years ago. Man. It works. Lucky. It? You better yeah. check again. All right. Let's go out the live cam right now. 91 degrees. Adam Kasky not in studio with us, but he is live from Red McCombs Toyota. Oh. And Steve, you noticed? We moved inside this I did, time I around. Did it was so that. sticky, and, <laughs> oh, sticky and muggy out there, and a little sweaty. So it's nice to be in the showroom right now. And you know, we're going to be back to talk about the chip shortage, what that means uh, to the car industry, this and that, and Remington Combs Toyota coming up later on. I want to get to the weather first here. We've got limited limited time, and get right to it. Taking a look at our temperatures, most of us in the low to mid 90s, 91 officially uh, in town here at San in San Antonio. And as we go through the evening, falling through the 80s then the 70s, and by midnight we'll be in the mid-70s, waking up to a temperature near 70 tomorrow morning. Mostly clear sky, but a fairly colorful sunset on the way, so have your cameras ready uh, shortly after 7.30. Uh, tomorrow, sunny, mid-90s, a 10% chance of a shower. That's about it. But there is going to be a noticeable difference next week. We're going to talk about that coming up. is and we're joined tonight by assistant director of metro health dr anita kirin this is our covid 19 update for the san antonio community today we're reporting 734 new cases of covid 19. our seven day moving average has gone down and is now 808. we are unfortunately reporting 13 new deaths due to covid this evening we've lost a total of 4162 people in our community to this virus and remember these are loved ones they're not numbers they're fathers and sons mothers and daughters loved ones um, lives well live, lived and now lost so please keep them and their families in your prayers this evening in our hospitals there are 960 patients uh, in local area hospitals uh, we are thankful that number is below 1,000 now for a few days there were 114 new admissions in the last 24 hours. That is our low number for quite some time. 330 patients are in the ICU this evening with COVID and 212 are on ventilators. 84 patients in area hospitals are unvaccinated. Uh, 22 patients are children uh, as of today. At this time, uh, in terms of our vaccination rates, almost 1.2 Bear County residents, excuse me, 1.2 million Bear County residents are fully vaccinated and 1.4 million have received at least one dose. As a reminder, Metro Health will be launching a vaccine incentive very soon. Uh, the people eligible to receive an incentive of a $100 HEB gift card are those receiving the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the second dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccinations. And this incentive will only be available at Metro Health uh, vaccine clinics and the gift cards will be available until supplies last. So stay tuned for that. We'll have an update next week on when that will be rolling out and that will be very soon. So let me now turn it over to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And, and good numbers. They're looking better, at least. I know that everybody's committed to making sure that we're, we're masking up and, and those that aren't vaccinated getting vaccinated. Uh, in addition, there's going to be some news coming out uh, tomorrow. I know the, the um, FDA is going to be meeting um, with a potential recommendation to the CDC on a booster. Uh, we don't have any information yet on when uh, those will be available, but uh, stay tuned. I think starting next week, there's a possibility, particularly those who were in line at the beginning back in December that got vaccinated, that, that uh, the booster will be available starting hopefully um, as soon as next week. Um, in, ter in terms of the numbers, I wanted to just point out and give a, just a quick shout out to uh, those that are working over at Freeman, uh, the regional infusion center where we, we think uh, certainly there's a relationship to the folks that are getting treated over there and hopefully the dip in the number of hospitalizations. Another 94 folks uh, got the antibody uh, infusion treatment there today, averaging about 100 a day. So um, again, we, we wanna just thank all of our first responders, those that are, that are uh, responding to this community um, pandemic, those that are on the front lines. Um, and again, I think overall, we're all responding in a certain way because we're, we're heeding the advice of those public health professionals that are telling us uh, what to do. And that is, of course, keeping distance, masking up, 
and getting vaccinated if you have not gotten vaccinated. So please do that. Plenty of opportunity to, and uh, let's just keep it up. So thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. I uh, want to remind you, uh, part of our success here in, in containing this virus uh, is the testing of folks who have symptoms. Uh, so if you need a testing location or a vaccination clinic, please visit. All right, that's the very latest from City Hall, hearing from the mayor and county commissioner Justin Rodriguez there. 734 new cases. The seven-day average continues to drop. We are now at one at 808 in our seven-day. 13 new deaths, though. That takes our total to 4,162. Um, interesting, spec interesting that they seem to feel like maybe we've turned a corner. Yeah, a little hopeful. They did mention that 60 patients currently in the hospital, uh, still 330 people in the ICU and uh, about 200 more on ventilators. So they are crediting this obviously to uh, more vaccinations, at least 1.4 yeah. million here in Bear County receiving that first dose. But yeah, like you said, maybe a little hope. Yeah, that things are are starting to to look better for San Antonio. Yeah, and something that we don't we we maybe have missed in this whole thing. There's an infusion center at Freeman Coliseum. Your doctor can send you there to hopefully keep you out of area hospitals if you have COVID-19. And Commissioner Rodriguez giving a shout out to the frontline workers there. They're averaging about 100 people a day that are showing up at the Freeman Coliseum to get this infusion to help keep you out of the area hospitals. And we know a lot of people still have questions about those booster shots yeah. and they're saying that as early as next week. So in one week we could possibly see that rollout of those booster shots. But of course, waiting on the FDA and that CDC recommendation. Yeah. All right, let's go now to Red McCombs Toyota, the showroom, the man with the thermometer Thursday tie on where it's nice and cool. <laughs> Adam. Oh, it all matches today. It all matches. Red McCombs Toyota thermometer with the thermometer Thursday tie. And we were, out, we were outside at 5 o'clock. If you're watching that, it was 91 degrees. Oh, look at this. About 72, 73 in here. It feels so much better. And actually, we will have our first noticeable cold front of the season hitting us midweek next week. So let's talk about it. Take a look at what we're expecting in the drop in dew points, You know, the measure of moisture in the air, the humidity. Take a look at the graphics here, and you see that, that big drop off as we get into the middle part of next week. Our Deweys will be going from the 60s, which is where they are now, and stay in there through the weekend and even Tuesday of next week, and then, bam, they drop off into the 40s. So you'll notice a big drop in the humidity and a bit of a drop in the temperature as well. Take a look at the seven-day forecast. I mean, we're talking high temperatures, mid-90s, just like today, tomorrow through the weekend, even on into Tuesday. And right now we're anticipating a dip into about the upper 80s behind that cool front. So don't be thinking, you know, hoodie sweatshirts, fire up the bonfire. We're not quite there yet. This is just our first little taste of a little bit, a hint of autumn, especially in the early mornings and the lack of humidity. Okay. We are here live, Red McCombs Toyota. Every year I love to come by, thank them for being a wonderful sponsor of Thermometer Thursday and being a part of this. I'm joined by Scott Brown here of Red McCombs Toyota. And okay, chip shortage, supply chain shortages, we've had stories on it. You've seen it on the news, you hear this, read this, read that. Uh, what kind of impact is it having? What, or what are the misconceptions, really? Some of the misconceptions are that you just can't get new car inventory. That businesses are going out of business because you look at these lots as you drive around the town and nobody has any cars. They there. look empty. They look empty. The reality is and the truth is, is that we still have new cars. You can still get a new car. You just have to wait a little bit to get what you're looking for. Okay, so what are we talking like? Months, years, how long do you have to wait? Nothing drastic. You okay. come in, you place an order for a car, it's typically two to three months, and we can have exactly what you want here at the dealership ready for delivery. What if you don't want to wait? If you don't want to wait, it's a great question. We have a ton of pre-owned inventory. There's no shortage in pre-owned. We have certified pre-owns that give you the same as new car warranties, and there's a lot to choose from, and you can come take delivery today. Okay, so chips, through these little things, right, little chips that go in computers, how does that affect a car? I mean, what parts are we talking about here? So there's there's... Thousands of parts that go in a car, and if you're missing one part, you can't build it. So it's like a big puzzle. So and if like, you don't have that corner or that one spot... Exactly. You can't get the car produced. So there's something as simple as chips, or nav screens, or ECUs that have a little bit of a supply chain issue like everything else in the industry right now. Okay, and you, you may be wondering, has this affected you know employment and how, what's the business like and all that? We're going to touch on that a little bit coming up uh, next half hour, and we'll have our winner of this week's homemade thermometer. Yeah, we'll see you then. 
You know, Alicia's been really excited about Thermometer Thursday, Adam, just so you know that. I can't contain the excitement. <laughs> I don't know if she's I don't know if she's sincere about that. Or well, not. Okay. anyway, uh, let's move on to sports now. And uh, the Cowboys getting a big man back in front. Yeah, uh, Zach Martin was out because he tested positive for COVID-19, yeah. but I feel like he was more bummed that he could not be there for his teammates for the season opener in Tampa Bay more so than actually testing positive for the virus. Plus, the Poth Pirates are getting ready to host Shiner coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys starting right guard Zach Martin is back with the team after being away to battle COVID-19. He said he knew something wasn't right when he was eating dinner with his wife and he couldn't taste the food. Zach got a phone call the next morning, Saturday, September 4th, from the team informing him he tested positive for the virus. He said he lost his taste and smell and dealt with a lot of head congestion, but he was lucky not to get bad fevers. He tried to stay active last week by doing some cardio to be in decent shape for this week. Missing the Cowboys season opener last week at Tampa Bay was a bummer for Zach. Just terrible timing. I mean, I would love, obviously love to be out there last week with those guys, but, um, you know, back now, get it out of the way and hopefully move forward here. It, it's very frustrating, especially the timing, but, you know, this is, this is the world we live in right now and, um, you know, definitely not going to be the last guy this year that's dealing with this. So, um, you know, we just got to deal with it when it comes our way. The boys are dealing with the loss of DN Demarcus Lawrence, who's reportedly out six to eight weeks with a broken foot. Coach McCarthy said he suffered the break during a one on one pass rush drill when he was going around the corner. In college football, the Texas Tech Red Raiders are 2 0 after beating Houston 38 21 and edging out Stephen F. Austin last Saturday 28 22. Against the Cougars in week one, the Red Raiders allowed 77 rushing yards on 35 attempts. Then SFA had 31 yards on 30 carries. So after two games, the Red Raiders run defense has only given up 1.66 yards per carry. Head coach Matt Wells was asked why his run D is so good early on. The play of our D line, I think as the game wears on, we get stronger. Quite frankly, Jarrett, probably the depth at linebacker playing six backers has allowed that because those guys have, uh, have rotated in um, quite a bit. And they've, they've stayed fresh, but, um, you know, you, you, that's, that's, that's what we want to be. Tech's run D will be put to the test this Saturday at home against Florida International. The Panthers are averaging 6.8 yards per rush. The Post Pirates are getting ready to host the Shiner Comanches tomorrow night. Shiner went 14-0 last season and won the Class 2A D1 State Championship. Shiner is 3-0, while Poth is 2-0 this season. Now, the Pirates game last week against CC London and Three Rivers was canceled because they couldn't get officials to work the game. That means the Pirates last played Friday, September 3rd, when they beat Falls City 17-14. The Pirates are confident and well-rested after an unexpected bye week. I think both ways, you know, we got some young kids that I would have loved to have that game last week to, to help them grow up a little bit more. At the same time, that Fall City game was a very, very physical football game. So it gave us a little week to, to, to heal up a little bit and, and get ready for the Shiner team. Well, the bye week helped us prepare our own on Poth, but this week we've really been focusing on Shiner and they're a very good team, but we're going to go out there and we're going to play the best. And I think there's a really good chance we'll come up with another win. This is my second year here, but before I even got here, I knew how big that game was for both cities, both towns, how big it was for the community and everyone, and we just wanted to go out there and give it a good game, and I think we did that. Shiner at Poth. I'll be live at Poth tomorrow at 6, and then live again at Poth, the night beat with all the highlights. See, at first I thought you were going to be live in Shiner, <laughs> and I was like, get there a little early, yeah. maybe tour the brewery, but mm -hmm. that, you're going to be yeah, that didn't work. That's probably whole, whole better. <laughs> That's probably better. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. We'll be right back. It is a time where we try to separate fact from fiction, especially when it comes to COVID-19. Dr. Ruth Bergeron with the Long School of Medicine from UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease specialist, joining us as she does most Thursdays. Doctor, thank you for joining us. You know, a lot of the discussion is about booster shots. Are they needed? When should we get them? Who should get them? It, kind of break it down for us about where we are on booster shots and if they are necessary. 
Okay, this is a really hot topic and we're all learning and tomorrow is gonna be an important day in this story. Um, it is a fact that the Biden administration announced that boosters would be available to most Americans starting September 20th. It is also true that that announcement happened prior to the advisory committees, the vaccine advisory committees of the FDA and the CDC having their meetings and weighing in. So tomorrow what happens is there's a vaccine advisory committee for the FDA, it's an independent panel, that's going to meet and review a lot of data, including data from Israel and data from Pfizer that shows how immunity begins to decline in the months following the vaccination. And they will take into consideration the dropping in the antibody levels, but also um, breakthrough infections. Something that's confusing to everybody and has, is causing some delay in consensus building is that we believe the breakthroughs are being driven by two factors. One is possibly declining immunity, but the other factor being the Delta variant, which seems to be more infectious. So after tomorrow, we'll have a little bit clearer idea of where people come down. And the following week, next week, there will be a meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices from the CDC, and they will weigh in as well with specific recommendations about who exactly should get a booster dose. I can make a prediction, and I predict that there will be stronger recommendations for people over 65 and healthcare workers to get boosted, stronger than for kids that are um, teenagers or 12 and up. It's the younger you are, probably the less likely it is going to be a strong recommendation for boosting. A question that we have from viewers is what about when it comes to the flu shot? Are you able, would you be able to get that flu shot as well as the booster shot at the same time? Are there any risks associated with that? Right, so actually we really want everybody to get the flu shot. Uh, it's as important as ever and you can get it on the same day. You can get, whether it's your first or your second or your booster COVID shot, you can get it at the same time and on the same day as your influenza vaccine. And the one thing to know is that you should get those two shots at least an inch apart from each other if you're having it on your arm or in a completely different limb, meaning the other arm or your leg. The monoclonal uh, infusion center that's set up at the Freeman Coliseum, set up in many different communities, is that treatment okay for children? So it is actually authorized for emergency use for 12 and up. They specify that children must be at least uh, 40 kilograms. And it is not for just everybody. This is uh, for people with symptomatic COVID who are at high risk of having a bad outcome. And in kids, that would really describe children with, say, sickle cell anemia, some kind of neurodevelopmental disorder, asthma or lung disease, or people who are de dependent on uh, medical technical devices for their survival. Um, but these are really important uh, advances for everybody. And the data show that getting a monoclonal antibody infusion in the right time frame can decrease your risk of having to go to the hospital or die from COVID by about 70%. So it's a really important advance and people need to be aware and not wait a long time before seeking help from a medical professional. These things are gonna work best if it's within seven days of when you got sick. And lastly, we know about that Active 6 study. What are the ways that people can still get involved in that? Active 6 is an opportunity for people to take medication in the outpatient setting. These are some pills that have been uh, FDA approved already and have a long safety record, uh, but they've been repurposed. And you can enroll in it without ever having to go to a clinic or a hospital. You just go online to www.active6study.org. That's A-C-T-I-V-6-S-T-U-D-Y.org and you will learn more about it there. You do have to be 30 years old or older, and this is only for people who have a diagnosis of COVID that's been confirmed. And this is a study that's taking place at UT Health San Antonio right now. That's exactly correct, thanks. Yeah, Dr. Ruth Bergren, UT Health San Antonio Long School of Medicine, as always, appreciate your time. Thank you. And we'll be back after the break.
Welcome back. An organization here in San Antonio is helping preserve and promote Hispanic culture. For the past 30 years, the Guadalupe Dance Company has been entertaining and educating audiences through Flor Corico Dance. The first performance for the Guadalupe Dance Company was back on September 15, 1991, during the city's celebration for Mexico's Independence Day. And they celebrated their 30 years with that same event yesterday at Market Square. The group says keeping their traditions alive is what keeps them going. Take a look. It's through the history lessons embedded in the music, choreography, and traditional attire that Mexican folklorico dancers hope to preserve and promote their culture. Belinda Manchaca, now the education director for the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, vividly recalls the dance company's first folklorico performance back in 1991. She also remembers Jeanette Chavez, a dancer with the company who 30 years later now serves as a dance coordinator for the group. Their presence on stages all across San Antonio proved that their mission to preserve the Mexican culture and tradition lives on. This is who we are, this, that's, our, that's our history, and we owe it to our ancestors, we owe it to our community. I think that's why the Guadalupe Dance Company has survived the 30 years, because we're based in tradition, we're informed by our history, but we are able to tell our stories of our community. These women and the rest of the members of the Guadalupe Dance Company hope to lead the next generation of folklorico dancers. And that big celebration for their 30th anniversary will be on Friday, October 1st. We'll talk about it coming up. All right, Adam Kasky at Red McCombs Toyota. Sniffing cars. Sniffing cars. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of odd, but, but Alicia says she does it all the time. I go to the showroom at the State Fair, Thank and that's you. honestly what I do. See? See? Yes! Some people right? shop for cars, Come some on, people there's... apparently sniff for cars. So <laughs> I think it's sniff great. for cars, yes. Yeah. Yes, and I, I know, Steve, you're not surprised that I'm the one sniffing around this showroom. <laughs> Alicia and I, we'll go, uh, we'll go car shopping together next time one of us needs one, okay? Yeah, we, we get each other. We understand it. <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to talk about chip shortage and stuff. And of course, get to thermometer Thursday in a second. Um, <laughs> this showroom smells so good. I always love it. Uh, but let's talk about weather, too. Uh, let's take a look at what we have going on outside right now. We're actually sitting at 91 degrees. So we are running a little above average. We had a high temperature of 94. We've dropped down to 91 right now and we'll make it down into the lower 70s by tomorrow morning. You look at the high temperatures across the entire state today, 90s. You're not looking at triple digits, but again, we were a little above average. Usually we're upper 80s, right near 90 degrees, at least by average standards, by the calculated average. But across the state, mostly well into the 90s. Current readings right now, well, we haven't dropped all that much from the high temperatures. And so usually you don't see a big difference at six o'clock from your actual high for the day. Usually it's just a couple of degrees. The newest drought monitor is out. And let's take a look at the drought monitor. We're in good shape. It's good to see, but the bright yellow areas do indicate abnormally dry and the brown areas indicate light drought, but we're only minimal, minimal percent of Texas actually in drought. Let's talk about rain chances. Let's get right to it, get to the big picture, full screen. Look at the satellite and radar. We've got a weak little disturbance off to the north of us. That weak disturbance will give us some chances of rain, but don't get too excited. I really only have um, about a 10% chance the next couple of days. Take a look at those rain chances. Uh, they're pretty slim. Only 10% through Sunday. Then Tuesday night into Wednesday, that's when we have a better chance, more scattered activity as a cold front moves in. Speaking of the cold front, it's going to really drop our humidity. We're looking at dew points in the 60s through the weekend and even early next week. But then that big drop off, it's going to feel more fall like in terms of a lack of humidity by this time next week. As for the tropics, quick update, two systems out there way out in the Atlantic. Right now, no threat to the U.S. or especially the Gulf Coast. Uh, but something, of course, we'll keep, keep an eye on as they're likely to develop into our next tropical cyclones and possibly, possibly become named storms. So tonight, temperatures gradually falling through the 80s, then down into the mid-70s. So we'll, by 10 o'clock, be about 80 degrees, midnight, mid-70s. It's, of course, still a little sticky out there and muggy, but if you don't like that, by this time next week, you should notice a change. Tomorrow... Really, nothing changes. There's just a lot of sunshine, some fair weather afternoon clouds. And we're also talking that 
10% chance of a stray shower or two. And that goes all the way through the weekend. I mean, we could say 20%, but I think, I think that's even a little too generous. I mean, cross your fingers. If you're lucky and actually get a quick downpour next few days, might be time to go buy a quick lottery ticket. You know, it's one of those uh, situations, meteorologically speaking. So looking at the seven day forecast, temperatures hold steady mid nineties through the weekend and into next week. And then we get to that cold front territory and don't expect, you know, having to fire up the furnace or anything or, you know, get out the sweaters. We're just looking at some high temperatures, upper 80s. We'll be fine tuning those numbers as this cold front actually develops. Once it actually develops and is something to measure, we'll fine tune those numbers. We may have some even cooler mornings than what we're um, anticipating right now. And of course, the best chance of rain with that will be Tuesday night, some scattered showers with that, and then that little temperature drop, highs in the upper 80s, maybe a bit cooler. Oh, Alicia, I know you were feeling that, right? Whenever that animation rolls, you were feeling it too. <laughs> so we're live here at Red McCombs Toyota, I-10 UTSA Boulevard. I've got Scott Brown here with me. Scott, we're chatting earlier. You, you can still get vehicles. Just if you want a new one, you just have to wait a little bit. But they, they, they come in and they go, whatever. Um, tell me, what about personnel? You know, people drive by, you know, these dealerships all the time. They see some empty lots, some that aren't necessarily empty. What does it mean for staffing and employment? So that's one of the things about working for the McCombs family. They've been great through this whole pandemic. And even though you see empty lots, we're still selling cars. We still have vehicles delivered to our customers. And they have done zero layoffs, zero layoffs since the pandemic started. So it's just an amazing company to work for and we're thankful for the family. So that's one thing that um, I was curious about, you know, how does it affect employees? And it's good to hear that nobody's been laid off through this despite this chip shortage that issue okay well first of all i want to present of course this beautiful thermometer thank you for being part of the thermometer thursday family for so long and uh we got a little surprise here so um one of the employees here she doesn't even know uh yvonne her daughter's studying meteorology yes you're live on tv with us surprise your daughter at Texas Tech studying meteorology. We have to give you a thermometer for that, yes. So congrats, you are one of the winners. Impromptu, surprise winners. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And then we also have full screen, Abraham Dominguez, the other winner. Abraham Dominguez, the winner that the computer chose <laughs> for Thermometer Thursday, the homemade thermometer. I was up till about 2 a.m., lost track of time because I was uh, making scales for the thermometers and whatnot. It gets away from you when you get into the groove and get into the zone, but you can go to kset.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. Alicia, welcome. All right, now here's the deal. You know Alicia has an ulterior motive. She wants her own thermometer. You know, I know, I know you find that hard list. to believe. You get list. no requests, but on the yeah. List. Oh. Yeah, you're on the list. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. On the list, yep. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Morning, hope you had a great night. It is Thursday, September 16th. An update now on a deadly shooting. A man killed in a drive-by shooting identified as Ernest Franks. He died a week ago today near Gibbs Street and North New Braunfels on the east side. San Antonio police say Franks standing in a parking lot with a woman when someone drove up to them and fired multiple shots. Both were taken to BMC. Franks did not survive. That last check, the woman was in stable condition. No arrests have been made. Several families now forced to find a place to stay after their homes were destroyed by fire overnight. Flames broke out at the Oak Creek Apartments about 1230 this morning. That's in the 6100 block of Vance Jackson on the northwest side. Nationwide campaign to roll out COVID booster shots is in flux. The Biden administration set September 20th as the date to make boosters available to all vaccinated Americans and states and cities are already making preparations. Confusion on the southern border. Today, Governor Greg Abbott said he was shutting down six points of entry along the U.S.-Mexico border, citing a request by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Now he says that's actually not the case. This after a CPB spokesperson said they had no plans to shut down any ports of entry. In an emailed statement, Governor Abbott says he issued the order to, quote, stop these caravans from overrunning our state, end quote, and called the situation dire so dire that CBP is requesting the state's help. A few hours later, he said in part, quote, the Biden administration has now flip-flopped to a different strategy. 